Good morning, everybody. I'm so glad that you could be with us today. We're going to go ahead and get our service going this morning. We're going to start out singing Ancient of Days. So let's go ahead and get going and get singing. Students everywhere, 
Um, but that doesn't mean that there is no work being done. As many of my students found out, as I had to call many people this week, we have to still complete the work. We're just doing it online. So all students who can hear my voice, remember that. You still have assignments to do. Take care of your business or you will be getting calls. Um, uh, Charla is continuing to recover, doing, doing okay, getting better. She actually did a couple things this week. So uh, got a little bit of work going this week. So praise the Lord for that. I have an additional prayer request. My brother, Joshua Cannon, lives in Fresno, California. He, uh, he thought he might have COVID, was having trouble breathing, was struggling, went in, and turns out he had a blood clot that had gone into his lung and was preventing him from breathing. That actually killed our grandfather uh, eight days after I was born, back in 73. Um, so it's very serious. He was in the hospital for a few days. They did some tests and ultrasound on his legs. He has two more of them in his legs. So uh, please be in prayer for him. He is a big guy. He is over 400 pounds. He's 6'3", big dude. And uh, this is also a uh, warning to folks too. Get up and move around as much as you can during this time of being enforced to be in your homes. My brother is a computer uh, technician guy, sets up IT for businesses and things like that. Was working nonstop. This is where everyone's working on computers from their home and he's setting them up from his computer at his home, working like a dog, um, but not getting up and moving around. And that was a part of how he got this situation going. He was doing a lot of sitting and not getting up and moving around enough and not getting enough blood circulation. And that was how part of how this happened. So I encourage you, even if you're stuck inside your house, get up and move around as much as you can because that was a part of this. Boy, as soon as this happened, I started getting up and moving as much as I could because I, I got that same DNA. So I am getting up and you see my legs boogieing here. I am moving as much as I can because I have that same DNA. So please take care of yourselves as much as you can. Move around, get as much exercise as you can because this is not an uncommon problem. So uh, take care of yourselves. So let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer. Let's um, be in prayer for those who are on the front lines in the COVID crisis. Let's be in prayer for um, be in prayer for those who have other related issues, like my brother Joshua, and maybe be in prayer for Malachi that he survives because he fell asleep again. He might not make it through the end of the service. All right, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come and to worship together. Lord, even though we're separated and isolated in homes, we know that where two or three are gathered together in your name, you are there also. So as we watch together, separated by distance and even separated by time, you're still gathered together in our midst. Lord, we pray for those who are sitting on the front lines of this crisis, who are working in healthcare, who are working in grocery, who are working in these businesses that are putting themselves in danger so that we can survive, do the things that we need to do. And Lord, we thank you and pray that you would put a hedge of protection around them for the things that they're doing and sacrificing for us. Lord, for our service this morning, we pray that we can put everything else that's going on aside, that we can open up our minds and open up our hearts 
and focus on you alone, nothing else. We can drive everything else out. And just really experience being in your presence. Really experience the presence of your Holy Spirit that we receive by gathering together in your name. Lord, we want to sing these songs for you and you alone. Lord, there's no one else around. We're in our homes. We don't have to be nervous about what we're going to sound like or anything else. We can just cut loose and worship you alone in spirit and in truth. Lord, help us to do that today. Lord, help everything that I sing, everything that I say, everything that I do this morning to reflect you and you alone. And everything that we hear, everything that we receive, everything that we experience to be genuinely you and your presence. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we're going back to our sermon series in the book of Acts, and we're going to look at what happens when Paul is in Ephesus and there's a conflict between those people who worship idols and idolatry in general and the Lord's church. And it focuses around that central concept of idolatry and Christianity. So we're going to sing some songs here focusing on true worship of the Lord and that relationship with Jesus Christ. We're going to start out with Who You Say I Am, which is one of the top three Christian songs in the country. Yeah. 
So I titled today's sermon, Who is God? Now those of you who've been at church regularly throughout the time that I've been here, this is the one I preach. I preached the sermon before when I first got here. It's something that I think needs to be covered on a fairly regular basis. We need to be able to answer this question. All believers do. And this is something, the nature of God, who he is is something that became a source of violent conflict when Paul was at Ephesus. On the third missionary journey, where we're studying in the book of Acts right now, it's Acts chapter 19, verses 21 through 42. Now, I'm not going to read this section right now. We're just going to talk about it. We're going to cover it a little more in detail next week, so I'm not going to read it and cover it again two weeks in a row. We're just going to kind of talk about it. We'll go over it, and we'll cover it in detail again next week. But what happens here is there is so much amazing work of the Lord going on that so many people are getting saved and leaving behind their old life that the people who make idols out of silver and make the books of spells and other things that were related 
to the cult of the primary goddess that was in Ephesus at the time, whose name was Artemis. They also called her Diana. It's Artemis in Greek and Diana in, in, in uh, Latin. There was a big celebration amongst the converts to Christianity, and they destroyed the things that were part of their old life in the cult of Artemis. I did some math based on the amount of silver that was worth that the Bible says. $11 million in today's money of cult items that they threw away and destroyed. Well, one of the guys who made the silver idols got freaked out and he starts a riot about we got to do something about this. This is affecting our bottom line. We're in trouble, guys. And a riot starts over people leaving idolatry for Christianity. And it was based on the economy, okay? It was what it was really based off of. But I wanted to talk about the difference between idolatry, idolatry and Christianity. What is this really based off of? What is this conflict that comes up over and over and over again in the Bible? What is this big difference? Well, let's talk about it. What are they really leaving behind? Idolatry itself. The Bible talks about idolatry in a lot of different forms. The followers of Baal, the followers of this, the followers of that. They talk about idolatry and they talk about idolatry in other things. About the love of money being idolatry. They talk about all kinds of different things as being idolatry. What is it? The conflict here was based off of economy. But they live under a different mindset. One of the big things is what they called in their day, and we call it now in our day, tolerance. They said you can never have too many gods. And a big problem that they had with the Lord's people was why can't you we just why can't you just add this Jesus to the other gods that are here? Why can't you just worship Artemis and Jesus? Why not just add him into the list? You're my friend. Why can't you just add, um, I'll add Jesus to the gods that I worship, and you add Artemis to Jesus who you worship. It works out great. Can't have too many gods, right? Can't hurt to have another one to pray to. In case this one don't come through for you, pray to another one, right? That was how they thought. Now, for those of us who are believers, those of us who are Christians, this is a shockingly terrible idea. But for them, this was the most normal thing in the world. If someone was your friend, you prayed to their God too. It was part of friendship. Must be working for them. I gotta give this a try. And vice versa. You just added it to the list. But you see, each idol each idol was an aspect of humanity. It's a carved image based off of some aspect of a person. So, Artemis, Diana, she was the hunter. She was the moon. She was um, young women, um, vibrant. Uh, she was the hunt. She was uh, vibrant um, maidenhood. She was girl power. 
there was like three or four different things that she had auspices over. And when you needed something of those sort of things, you prayed to her. If you didn't need something in that category, you just ignored her. But what about God? God with a capital G. Who's he? Well, in the book of Exodus, the God of the Bible, who is he? Well, there was a time when people really didn't know who he was. And he had to explain himself to people. A guy named Moses who had grown up in idolatry with the gods of Egypt. And one day when he was out, he was about 80 years old. He'd heard about God he heard stories, but he also worshipped the gods of Egypt when he lived in Egypt. He heard about God from his family and from other people that he lived with, his father-in-law. And then his adopted family in Egypt had worshipped the gods of Egypt, each one representing some idea, the Nile River, the God of the sky. The goddess of healing, the god of the dead. Each one had a human aspect and an animal aspect in Egypt. <clears throat> then he sees this bush that's burning, but it's not being consumed. And he goes and he investigates and he hears the voice of God saying, Take off your shoes, this is holy ground. And God gives him a purpose. And he says, you're going to be my voice to my people. I've heard their cries, suffering in Egypt, and I'm going to do something about it. And you're going to be the one who leads me. So let's look at Exodus 3. We're going to start in verse 13. Then Moses said to God, Behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel. Who will I say to them? The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they will say to me, what is his name? What will I say to them? Now he's asking God, what are you the God of? The, um, the word Sky in Greek is Uranus, Uranus, okay, which is also the word for sky. The goddess of victory is Nike, which means victory. You start to get the picture? Egyptians were the same way. They worshipped Things, they worship concepts, aspects of people, aspects of humanity, aspects of the human condition. And the name of their God was the concept. They worship sky, they worship denial, they worship death, or the protector of the dead, or whatever. So they're at, he's asking God, what are you the God of? What category can we put you in? Let's see what God says. God said to Moses, I am who I am. 
And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial name to all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, has appeared to me, saying, I am indeed concerned about you and what has been done to you in Egypt. So I said, bring, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanite, the Hizite, and the Amorite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite, to a land flowing with milk and honey. He won't give him an image to see. He just gives him something to draw his attention. Some miraculous thing that draws his attention. But it's not something he can make an image out of. And then when the Ten Commandments come, he says, don't you dare make an idol out of anything. Don't you dare make any image. He says, take your shoes off, you're on holy ground. They won't give him anything to put in a category. He says, you got it all wrong. He says, you're not even, you're playing hot and cold. He says, you're a glacier, man. You are so far off. Let me explain this to you. And then he gives him this phrase. He says, I am who I am. Now, Hebrew doesn't have tenses in the same way that we have past tense and this tense and that tense. It's a little different. So another way to say it is, I will be who I have been. It says, I am the one true God of everything. I am not the God of just this one thing. Or this one thing over here. I'm the God of everything. So stop thinking about the God of the Nile. Or the God of the sky. Or the goddess of healing or that. He said, I'm the God of all of it. So just stop. Stop thinking about this one box over here. Because I'm not that. I'm the God of everything. And then he goes on and he says, I'm the God of your fathers. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Because, see, they knew the stories. They knew the personal testimony of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. They knew all that. They knew how God had carried Abraham through his whole life, how God had carried Isaac through, how God had done all these miraculous things for Jacob and for Joseph. They knew those stories. They knew them. And he says... Remember what all those things that I did for Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. I'm going to be that same God for you. All those miraculous things that God did in Abraham's life. All those amazing things that God did for Joseph. I'm going to do that for you too. Not just because he's your father, your ancestor, but because I love you just as much as I love him. I'm going to be your personal God just as much as I was his personal God. You see... I had a relationship with them. And I'm going to have a relationship with you too. That's 
what he's talking about there at that burning bush. He's saying, I am going to have a relationship with you that is different than what you're seeing from these other people. You see, in idolatry, God is made in man's image. Let's go to Ramses. The children of Israel coming out in Moses' day, we're pretty sure that it's Ramses II who was the Pharaoh during that time period. You add up all the statues of all the people in the ancient world, we have more statues of Ramses than we do of anybody else in the ancient world. And here's the thing about Ramses, okay? Ramses had this thing. Ramses, we found um, 192 kids from Ramses. We found mummies of 192 kids or something crazy like that. All right? We found more statues of him than anybody else in the entire ancient world put together. And they're all supposed to be statues of the Egyptian gods. Horus, Anubis, uh, you know, uh, Amun, and all these things. But whose face is on that thing? Ramses. You know, Ramses' face is everywhere. All right? It's Horus, but it's Ramses' face. Amun, Ramsey's face. Ra, Ramsey's face. Anytime there's a woman, it's his wife over here in the corner. It's always him. He's the most conceited dude in the ancient world. He got all these sons everywhere. Ramsey's, 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 Ramsey's. Everywhere he went. He just couldn't get enough of himself. All right? Now, he wanted God in his own image. And the thing is, in idolatry, one of the big things that they're trying to do is they're trying to do what they can to get the gods off their back. If I give this sacrifice over here, then the Nile won't flood my house. If I give the sacrifices over here, then I'll get enough rain to get my crops in. If I give sacrifices over here, then my wife will have good childbirth and, and we'll be in good shape. Then the rest of my time, I can do what I want. If I get the sacrifice, if I do this, then the gods have no reason to do anything bad to me. I'm a good dude. I've taken care of my business. If I need something, a good harvest, a promotion, or something like that, then I'll go and I'll drop some extra sacrifice now the gods owe me. They owe me something. I get extra for them. And then each God has their own category. So if I need a little something in the romance category, I got to go to God's love. I need crops. I got to go to God over here. And the children of Israel fell into this. Everywhere they went, when they got to the, when they got to the promised land, God's love, Asherah, God of crops, Baal. They fell into it. What about Christianity? Christianity says man is made in God's image. It's not the other way around. We are a little aspect of God in our capacity to do the things that God has made of God's love. God is peace. So for a little bit of receiving his Holy Spirit, we can be a part of God's peace, God's love, God's joy. I do what I can because of what Jesus did for me. I'm not trying to earn anything. I'm not trying to make any bargains with God. The price has already been paid. I can't earn anything. I receive because of God's Grace. Grace, getting good things from God that you don't deserve. I can't earn it. I can't bargain for it. Because he's in control. Nothing is beyond his power and nothing can take us from him.
I don't have to go in and try and make some bargain with God. I don't have to go in and try and say, Oh Lord, if you'll just get me through this. See, idolatry is all about me. And before you say, hey, but I, I, don't, I don't do any idolatry. I'm not, I'm not sitting here worshiping. I don't have some idol of Baal over in the corner. I don't have some idol of, you know, of Zeus or something up there. I'm sure you don't. But let's think about how we think about worship. How we think about God. Idolatry is about me. About me keeping control. About me trying to be the center of my worship. About me trying to be the center of my life. It's a great line from a movie that I love that says you're supposed to be the star of your own story, right? You're supposed to be the star of your own life. And that sounds really good. But That's the old me. We talked about this last week in the Easter sermon. That's the old me. That's the me who died in my sin. He was the star of his own story. And what did it lead to? Sin. Broken. And if I kept on going, it would have led to eternal separation from Jesus Christ in hell. But now it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. So now I am not the star of my own life. Now the star of my life is Jesus. And the things that the Lord does in my life, he's the star. And I'm the supporting actor. In idolatry, we say, we go and idolatry worship says, God, if you'll do this, Lord, if you'll get me out of this situation, I'll go to church, I'll do this, I'll do that. I need some extra magic. But that bargain's on my terms, isn't it? If you'll do this, man, Lord, I'll, I'll, I'll come and I'll do, I'll do, I'll blah, 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 blah. And then as soon as that's over, Lord, my bargain's done. I'm going back to being me. I'm the star. Man, I better get in church. I haven't been there for a while. That lightning bolt's coming. I got to get God off my back. In the church for a while, okay, good, I'm good. Okay, I can go do what I want now. I check that box. These are bargains. That's idolatry worship. That's not Christianity. That's idolatry. That's looking for this magic in your life that you control, that you're in charge of. That's not, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. That's me trying to be the star of my life. And every single believer that I know has tried an idolatry style worship in their life. 
If we go back to Exodus, that was the golden calf. If the golden calf, they were trying to worship God their own way in the style, the idolatry way that they did in Egypt. But it doesn't work that way. Christianity is about Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Jesus becomes the star of my life. And it means that what I receive, my daily life, the power to change my life, the things that are new and different and the drive of my life comes from Jesus and not from me. The joy that comes from my life is because of the changes that His Holy Spirit made in my life. The peace that I have comes from knowing that God is in control and He's going to do something that is going to change my situation. The love that I have is because I know Jesus, because I know that He is, has everything under control and he gives me the ability to say I may not like what's going on right now I may not like what's happening with this person right now but I know the Lord is going to give me the ability to get through this situation and he's going to change it and there's going to be a ability for me to get beyond this problem that I'm having right now and we're going to get through this and I'm going to be able to have a good relationship with this person tomorrow or the next day or the next year, or whatever. So I could still love that person, even though right now, I'm not liking this person so much. But I can still love them, in Jesus' name. And we can go down the list of all the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, temperance, self-control. We can go all the way down the list. Patience. Oh my goodness, we need patience right now so much. And we can have that patience because we know God is in control and he's going to work this thing out for our good and for his glory if we're willing to be called by his purpose. If we're willing to make him the star and not try to be the star ourselves. Make him the star and make it about his grace, getting the things that we don't deserve instead of trying to make a bargain and make it all about us. And stay with us in control. If you haven't figured it out yet, you are not in control of this coronavirus situation. Get it through your head. You're not, and you're never going to be. You haven't learned it by now. Whoo! Take some remedial classes or something. Call me, do some tutoring. We'll do something. I don't know. Christianity is about Christ. Idolatry is about me. Because of that empty tomb on Easter, because of the bloodshed of the cross on Good Friday, turning our lives over to him, we can say that it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. He's become the star of my life. And now we can have a relationship with him. He's not the God of just one thing. There's no graven image. He's not a reflection of us. We're a reflection of him. And we can come to that experience where we find out who God is. That he is I am. I 
will be who I have been. No matter who you are in this country, no matter who you are hearing the sound of my voice, you know somebody who is a Christian. And you know somebody and you've seen somebody's life who is changed and different and is able to go through a life in a different way. They're just able to handle things and you can see God working in them. That's what God was saying. And that's what God is saying. When he says his memorial name to all generations is, I am who I am. I will be for you who I have been. For all these people throughout the generations who I have this personal relationship with. It's not because they are special people. It's not because I am special that God saved me. That God made me a pastor. That God did these things for me. It's just one thing that happened. When God gave me the opportunity, I said yes. I was in a church in Madera, California. I heard the pastor say that it had to be a personal thing that you couldn't just know things about God that it wasn't good enough to go to church it wasn't good enough to come from a Christian family my father was associate pastor in that church I've been at church every day since nine months before I was born I was there three four times a week said that wasn't good enough. That I had to make my choice myself. I said, you know what? I've never done that. He's right. And I did. I was a little kid. But I realized that, man, I need to make that decision. That's the difference. Nothing special. Just someone willing to say, Yes, Lord. Same thing with Moses. Same thing with the disciples. All of those people, they were willing to go. We tend to think of them as superheroes or something because of all the things that God did with them. But see, here's the thing. It's not about me. It's about Christ. It's about what God does. Not about the individual. It's about Christ who lives in me. And once that happens, We catch fire in our heart. Our life begins to change. And 
like to hear you say all the time, we receive his Holy Spirit and we begin to experience the things that come from the presence of the Holy Spirit. His love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and self-control. That's what that little drawing there is about. That heart that's caught on fire for the Lord. That burning bush that was a sign of God's presence has become a burning heart on fire for God. Are you willing for that to be you today? Do you really want to know who God is? Do you want to change from a life of idolatry, trying to make a bargain, trying to wheel and deal, and give that up, and learn about the I Am, the one who will be who he has been for all those people, From the beginning of time to now. Robin, I'm going to do something a little different. In closing, I'm going to sing for you a little song. It's the first song I ever learned. I performed it in church when I was three years old. And to be honest, I don't think I didn't know anything what I was doing when I was three. But as I grew up, it's become more and more important to me because words are very simple and they have a, a strong statement. So in closing, just listen to what I have to say here and then we'll pray together. The chimes of time ring out the news another day is through someone know that you are the I am, that you will be who you have been, that you will be the same, 
that you were for Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, for all the people in the Bible, and for all the good Christian brothers and sisters that we know, all those around us. You'll be that same for us. And Lord, if there's anyone out here today who's hearing my voice, who doesn't know you, who doesn't have that personal relationship with you, who's still trying to make bargains, who's still trying to make deals, Lord, I pray that they will give that up and that they will offer themselves up to you. That they'll make that prayer, they'll ask for forgiveness and they'll do this right. They'll come to you, the great I am, and make a personal commitment to you. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name. I am. Amen. If you think you're ready to do that, get in touch with me. My phone number is on the church website. You can access that here on Facebook. You can send me a message. Do whatever it is that you need to do. Or get in contact with somebody you know is a real Christian. You know can really help you. But make that commitment today. I thank you for being a part of this service. We're going to have more content every week. We've got a YouTube channel. We've got all kinds of ways to get in touch with us. And to have content throughout the week. Just make sure that you are worshiping and you're a part of what God is doing in this community.